Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, another one of the Forum 360s. Uh, I'm hoping that this one will be the most memorable, um, not because of the humor, but because of the content, or maybe for both. Uh, and this morning, uh, we're going to be talking about and, ask, and try to answer the question, how will AI minimize safety risk? Uh, I'm John Paul Clark. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And with me today are uh, my faculty colleague from Oregon State University, uh, Dr. Julie Adams. Um, I have Dr. Mike Brown, from, uh, who is from Collins Aerospace, and he's an associate director for AI research um, and CIO. Right? Of a different organization. organization. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> At International Council on Systems Engineering, right? And then um, we have Andrew Dunbeck, who is with us. He's general manager of flight safety at Delta Airlines. Um, not here physically, but here virtually is Dr. Chu Chu Fan, who is assistant professor in aeronautics and astronautics at MIT. And then last but not least, uh, Tori Radcliffe, um, who is the principal director of technology at the Aerospace Corporation. And, and as I learned in the green room, somebody who I, uh, uh, knew from when he was an uh, undergrad at MIT, so, uh, uh, and his grad advisor was in the office next to mine when I was a faculty member, so we're like, we know each other. <laughs> so with that said, um, I'm going to have each of them talk a little bit about their journey here in terms of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis to set some context for our discussion today. So I I'm going to go in the same order, so Julie. Sure, so I'm Julie Adams. I'm the Associate Director of Research for the Oregon State Collaborative Robotics and Intelligent Systems Institute. I'm also a full professor of robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, computer science, mechanical engineering, and industrial engineering at OSU. I've worked in AI, robotics, and uh, human factors for 35 years, and for the last 15 or so years, I've worked in uncrewed aircraft, generally group one. Uh, prior to that, I worked on crewed aircraft at Honeywell for about a year. Um, so my research really focuses on the intersection of how do we use AI to help humans interact with complex systems. Uh, most of my focus obviously now is on robotics, but uh, having worked on the crewed aircraft and also on chemical systems uh, in industry. Thank you. Barkley? Yes, hi, Barkley Brown. Uh, so I'm Associate Director of AI Research at Collins Aerospace, which, as you probably know, is part of RTX, right? And Collins makes the stuff that goes inside the aircraft, right? All the, all the various systems, avionics and so forth. And um, my background is systems engineering. So I'm a systems engineer for a long time, involved with Encozy, as you mentioned, and, and so on. And then I came to AI to sort of put them together. So how is AI going to help engineering? And then just in the last couple of years, I kind of glommed onto this large language model things. Anybody ever heard of large language models, maybe? Yeah. Did, you, did you know that ChatGPT just had its one-year birthday? Can you believe the impact? Like, just in one year, it's a household word. It's crazy, right? So, um, but I'm, so I'm all about that, right? So my, my full-time job is trying to figure out large language model applications in Collins. So that applies both to engineering processes within Collins, but also to the potential introduction of AI kind of capabilities into our products, into uh, systems and so forth, that could affect safety. So that's kind of my relationship to all this. Thanks. Uh, Andrew? Hey, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I want to first of all thank the panel and the people who put this on for letting the airline be up here. So I'm Andrew Dumbeck. I represent Delta Airlines as the general manager of flight safety. And it's great. This is actually my first time at the conference since uh, grad school. So it was great to uh, come back, a very different uh, look and feel for me coming as an aerospace engineer and now coming back as someone working at an airline. Um, and so a little bit about, you know, wh what do I do and how, how did I get onto this panel? Um, well, coming out of uh, school as an aerospace engineer, probably had hopes and dreams like many of you in the audience and uh, ended up going to a company called MITRE, when I know some folks from MITRE are here. And I believe I got hired there because I knew how to MATLAB code. I think that was the, uh, if you guys remember that, I'm dating myself a little bit. And so they, they brought me in and they said, what do you know about safety? I said, not, not much. Took a course, maybe, and uh, fell in love with it. And, and the challenges that are in safety that we're going to talk about today on that panel 
And I would encourage you guys to ask questions and think about how that applies in the field of aerospace, especially when it comes to big data. So I was very lucky to be at a time and place when uh, safety was continuing to be invested in um, you know, through the FAA, and that, that, that investment continues today in other, other areas. And then there's a lot of data coming, coming in as well, collected off the aircraft. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, today. Is, is that's gonna be a big theme of our, our panel. So from that, I was able to go to Delta Airlines, and, and now in that role, I manage the safety data programs at Delta Airlines, which is a collection of aircraft data that we get on every flight. Um, it's collected at uh, multiple times a second for thousands of parameters on some of our, our airframes. So it's a lot of data that comes in that way. And then we also get safety reports from our frontline operators. So those are two of the areas that I'll be kind of talking through today and the challenges, unique challenges of being in an operational environment and having that data and how we apply AI. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, Chuchu? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Everyone, this is Chuchu. Chu. I'm a assistant professor at MIT Aero Astro. Sorry, I cannot be here um, physically today because I have to teach a class during our very uh, important IAP period right after the panel. So um, I'm a fourth year assistant professor here. I did my PhD at the University of Illinois Urbana Campaign, and I had a very short postdoc at Caltech. My PhD th uh, research, which also lasted until today, is about safety. And uh, my lab here at MIT is called the Reliable Autonomous System Lab at MIT Realm, in short, if you'll just put realm.mit.edu, that's our website. So we here, uh, my group have uh, 13 people, including me, working on uh, using, uh, like combine the rigorous analysis methods with machine learning to understand how we analyze, design, and verify autonomous systems. And our work mainly look at like autonomous systems across different computational stack, all the way from sensing, perception, to decision-making and control, and uh, understand what type of uh, rigorous uh, analysis can be used and what's the limitation and what's the role of machine learning and recently also some sort of a large language models, uh, as it was mentioned, so in, in the decision making, uh, like in, in the role of make, uh, decision making and how we uh, provide assurance, different level of assurance and uh, assurance cases for these systems. I'd be happy to discuss some of the more technical advances in this domain today and uh, maybe share some of the uh, challenges we, we are facing right now. Thank you, Chuchu. -Chu. Um, Tori? Yeah, hi, I'm Tori Radcliffe with the Aerospace Corporation. Um, so I'm gonna bring a slightly different perspective here than the, some of the other members on the panel. I see space as sort of the opposite extreme of say commercial aviation, right? Where safety is critical on a day-to-day -day basis, you're know, flying millions of people a day. On the space side, we don't really deal so much with traditional safety issues. We deal much more with mission assurance. <clears throat> My company, the Aerospace Corporation, is an FFRDC, which advises essentially government, uh, to historically government on how to do mission assurance. But recently we did stand up something we're calling the Space Safety Institute. As more and more players are coming into space and space is becoming increasingly congested, we're trying to interact much more with industry, non-traditional space players, to assure that space becomes or remains a safe place to operate. Um, so we're gonna be leveraging artificial intelligence in that. I will say I don't have an artificial intelligence background like a number of people on this panel. I wouldn't know one neural network from another neural network. <laughs> uh, but it is an area we are uh, quite interested in and pursuing. So. Thanks, Tori. So, um, you know, and, and as you know, with this Forum 36s, we get ahead of, get to get ahead of time and, and toss ideas around. And um, one of the things that came clear to us um, and was sort of obvious, but you know, it's, it's easy. One thing that distinguishes us as an aerospace community is our relentless focus on safety, right? That's the thing that really is a hallmark if you will, of aerospace. And, and that means mi minimizing risks. Risks to known unknowns and unknown unknowns, right? And we, we talk about those. So 
that led to a question is, what is our attitude towards risk? You know, do we try to avoid it? Are we allergic to it? Or do we embrace it and manage it? And I think the thing that I always tell my folks and friends in civil engineering, I hope nobody has a civil engineer in the room, you know, you, you have a factor of safety of two. <laughs> we have 1.2 <laughs> because that's the best we can get away with and still get off the ground, right? And so another thing about us, as our, in addition to our relentless focus on safety, is our embrace of, and, of, and how, of risk and how we manage it. And because we have lots of things at stake, people's lives, right, people's health, money, but also reputation. And I mean, I, I, not to be the elephant in the room, but you know, that's one of the things this past week. Reputational risk is huge for us in aerospace engineering. And because the costs are so high, we have to really keep those probabilities incredibly low if we have to manage those lists. So get, getting, when you have to think about low probabilities, you realize that understanding risk is the key to managing it. And we heard earlier today in the plenary about flight test engineering as being uh, an important basis for this. But we also know that simulation and analysis, and more so these days, data analysis, is our key to understanding risk. So with that said, you're not here to listen to me, you're here to listen to them. I'm a moderator. And so I'm gonna pose three questions. And uh, we're gonna go through these questions in order, but the answers will not be in this order because I don't want Julie to um, get uh, always pressured as being the first one. Um, so the first question is, how can we use AI and ML to accelerate and improve the process of testing? And we got a little bit to teaser of that in the plenary this morning, but we want to expand on that. Second question, really important, and I know Chu Chu has uh, lots of thoughts on this. How do we actually validate and verify AI when it's playing a role in decision making and control of a vehicle? It actually is online. And this includes also with human machine teaming involved as well, not just the machine alone. And then the third question, is how do we bring AI into the real world, the real operating world, um, in a manner where the amount of autonomous operation that we allow is commensurate with the confidence that we have in the system? So those are the three questions. Um, and I'm going to start with um, number one, and I'm going to put Andrew on the, on the docket for that, uh, <laughs> because he, is, um, he, he claimed and he boldly said that he's going to bring the operational perspective. Okay. And that includes acceptance testing of aircraft and validating how they right. behave in operations as well. So why don't you take the lead and then we can free flow after that. All right. Thanks, JP. Yeah, you know, talking about what is, I'll, I'll kind of introduce my answer with a little bit of what is our stance towards risk. I think that's kind of how you, you posed the, the introduction for the three questions. Obviously, as an airline, you know, we are... Um, adamant in our ability to make safety our top pri priority, and that is consistent across all of our goals, our goal planning. We just went through uh, our 2024 goal planning sessions, and safety is always our top priority. Um, that is, is a heavy investment for us. We, we don't have the luxury of, of getting to make mistakes, and so when you talk about what our attitude is, anytime something happens that's even a near miss, our leaders are, you know, quickly prioritizing that conversation and asking questions. So that poses a couple of challenges that I'll, I'll bring up as I kind of set up the answer for us. One is the challenge of, you know, how do you address those very small probability events that are happening? You know, a lot of folks are probably familiar with the Swiss cheese model, right? The whole James Reason Swiss cheese model that was popularized in the 80s and 90s. And so as we look at that and we see the, the propagation of potential errors or issues in the system, our leaders are always asking, how can we avoid that, right? What could we have done sooner? Where did we see the gaps? And when you're dealing with things that sometimes come across as very random events, that's a challenging thing to be put on the spot. We're reacting to those events. Another one of the challenges for us is when we look at this and we, and we talk about wanting to be proactive in safety, our customers already assume safety. So when they step on board an aircraft, a commercial aircraft, there's not really a question of, hmm, I wonder if this is a safe flight. 
Uh, you know, I know there are some folks, you know, have kind of a natural fear of flying, but the customer assumes that they're gonna land at their destination safely, and our leaders assume that as well. So if you come in with something and you say, okay, I have a great proposal for you, and I need an investment of $100 million, and we're gonna make safety improvements, our leadership team is gonna struggle with that, right? So we kind of have this juxtaposition right now of we have an incredible desire to keep safety our top priority, and we are very, very responsive to these events when they happen. But we also are in a position where the airline industry is very safe, and we, are, we have an assumption of safety as we go forward, and that can be a challenge sometimes when it comes to making large investments. We're also downstream of a lot of where you know, some of the testing would normally happen. It was great to hear uh, Jennifer earlier today talk about the flight test engineers, and I was um, contrasting that in my mind with, with our frontline uh, investigators, the people who react to significant events. They're the first ones to go out and respond on our team. So anything that happens, they're interfacing with the NTSB or other uh, agencies around the world, but they're also looking at the near-miss events, and they're coming back, and they're doing the investigation, similar to you know the, the CAST system that Jennifer talked about earlier today. They have a similar process for going through and telling us about what happened. But we challenge ourselves and say, that's not good enough. And I think that's, you know, you have this traditional way of looking at safety that is very much looking at uh, what were the, the barriers to having the event and what barriers were exceeded. And when you do that, you're relying on a lot of that, you know, single point evaluation, right? That, that very uh, reactive way of looking at it. And it starts to become almost a little deterministic in nature. And we know that the problems we're facing in a complex system just simply don't propagate that way. So one of our challenges right now is to try to use AI and understand how to address this very complex system of systems that we have, right? It's not just the operational data we have, it's the air environment that we, that we operate in with air traffic controllers. It starts with the training and standards programs that we have and how they set up the expectations for our pilots that, that sets the culture that we have, that we operate in. And so you have all of these different elements that are um, invested in terms of this very complex system of systems. And trying to look at any one of them by itself is gonna probably miss the mark with the state that we're in today. So for us, that's our challenge. And that's where we're starting to invest when you talk about, you know, how are we, what are we doing in the testing environment? We are constantly trying to bring in uh, the parties that are involved all the way throughout, right? So we're actively talking to our airframe manufacturers, we're actively talking to our avionics manufacturers, we bring air traffic control, and we run simulations with our air traffic controllers and our pilots together to understand communication, right? That can be uh, some of that, um, that barrier that might avoid uh, us having an accident. So when we're looking at all of these systems and trying to understand how to test and what we can do there, we really need to get beyond the first layer of cause and effect. And, and one of the things that we're doing right now is we're leveraging the, the AI, and we're doing a lot of supervised model um, building right now, and then we're trying to go through to understand what, not only what are the first layer effects and the data sets that we collect historically that are connected to safety events, but are also what are the second layer and the third layer effects that are maybe a little hidden in the data uh, and that we can use these machine learning models and, you know, more generally speaking, AI to try and pull out some of those insights. So when we bring in our partners like our air traffic controllers, the pilots, the training team, uh, some of the other leadership teams, we're not just looking at a, a very simplified problem. We're trying to bring the complexity of the system into those, into those training scenarios and into some of those um, expectations. Because that's what's going to happen in the operations, is you're going to get hit with a lot of complications, and it's not going to be very clean. So our job is to try and make it uh, as realistic as possible. Thanks. Uh, Tori, on the space side, uh, what are you do guys doing? Because, you know, these guys have a ton of data. You know, yeah. Because they have a FOQA and a digital data recorder. And, I mean, they're, they're pouring. Uh, do you have that as much data? And, yeah. And what are you doing in AI? <clears throat> right. So... When you asked that question, there was two things that I, I approached on. One I'm just going to touch very quickly, which is on the manufacturing side. Um, leveraging AI during the manufacturing process to automatically detect defects, right? 
that reduction of defects then allows you to go through a whole testing process faster, right? If you're doing additive manufacturing, you had do in situ uh, observation, if you will, mm. automatically detecting voids, those kinds of things. So that's one thing I want to put on the side. It's an interesting aspect. The other part gets to what he was talking about, which is we, spacecraft are fairly boring, right? You know, they just sort of sit up there and they orbit the Earth and they're doing the same thing day in, day out, right? Okay. It's a billion dollar asset sometimes, maybe now no, under a million dollars with some of the, the recent stuff, but it's a fairly boring environment. And but we used to have maybe a hundred parameters you were watching and you had 50 people watching a screen, right? And seeing if it stayed within one little red line, you know, these, these, these gaps. And as long as it did that, it was fine. Okay, but what we've done with artificial intelligence and those kinds of things, what's it, what that's enabled us to do is look instead of hundreds of parameters, tens of thousands of parameters. Yeah. And then you watch that as it sort of goes through the day in the life of the spacecraft, and you start to not just whether or not you've exceeded boundaries, but the tendencies over time and how they tick and taw and how one thing leads to another thing. But to get to his point, it's the one in the million thing you're really watching out for. So before we had this thing that said, okay, we'll watch the, the spacecraft and we'll watch its pattern of life and we'll, we'll come up with an alert if the pattern of life changes, okay? Well, the worst thing you can do from a safety perspective is tons and tons and tons of false alarms. And that's what it did, right? All kinds of reasons, like every once in a while, something would just behave a little bit differently and the, the AI would alert to that. But it didn't know why, it just knew it was different than the pattern of life. So what we've been doing much more recently is training it for trying to identify the things. And to do that, you have to do a lot of simulations of bad days. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like how they train the Apollo astronauts. Well, AI is like a crew member. Mm -hmm. You have to train it to recognize bad things and get through them. Otherwise, it'll just raise its hand and say, I don't know what's going on and you get a lot of hand raising, I don't know what's going on, and then it's not very useful. Um, so nowadays we're doing things, and especially on the things which are very unpredictable for space, and the, the most interesting one is probably cyber protection, oh, yeah. defensive cyber operations, right? So can you observe a spacecraft and then simulate a cyber attack on a spacecraft, and then have the AI sort of recognize that pattern? and then alert you specifically to that as opposed to every nu nuisance that comes on. Excellent. So I'm gonna to turn to you, Julie. Okay. Because uh, you know, Mark is gonna tell us how he builds all the stuff that you're gonna talk about in to, to provide <laughs> stuff for them. So I'm putting him on notice. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you know, you, you heard uh, Tori talk about the fact that you want your AI to be like a crew member to yeah. recognize bad things and respond. What are, we, what are you seeing in the academic world um, and also in the you know startup world, et cetera. So, so I actually want to start by the reason I have this is I want to read Asimov's Rules of Robots. Yes. Because you can replace the word robot with AI. Yeah. Um, so Asimov's three rules of robotics: robots must never harm humans, or through interac interaction inaction. allow it, or inaction. Sorry, I typed it wrong this morning. Allow a human to come to harm. Robots must always follow instructions from human beings unless. Uh, they will cause them to, to violate rule one, and robots must protect themselves unless it causes them to violate the other two rules. So I argue that in fact, you know, you can ch reverse the word robot for replace the word robot with AI in this context, and that's fundamental. Um, I also want to raise the fact that there is a lot of focus right now, and especially at this conference I've seen it, uh, machine learning, deep learning, large language models. And it's important to recognize that those are only pieces or a subset of AI as a field. And in, in fact, what Tori was just talking about, a lot of that identification of what's the most important information for the human to filter that information, sure, machine learning or large language models can help with that, but there's a lot of other techniques that may be much more reliable within artificial intelligence to provide that information. Um, so I think that there is a good context for it. There's also a lot of talk um, in the media about general AI. Um, so AI that is as intelligent as humans. And I think it was Tori referred to, alluded to the fact that the 
information or the learning outcomes or outcome from your AI is only as good as the data that you bring into it, right? So there are a lot of limitations, even with um, some generic AI methodologies about what you bring into it. And in the media, when they're talking about general AI, there's a lot of um, equating large language models to approaching general AI. And when you look at the outcomes, and yes, they're improving. So Barclay mentioned ChatGP is a, a year old day, and we, we've seen tremendous improvements in the large language model capabilities. Again, it's a limited set of data. And for a lot of the problems we're talking about when it comes to safety, you have very sparse data sets, or you have intermittent situations that are difficult to recreate. So those are difficult to assume that you can use something like machine learning on. In my space, we look at how humans interact with the systems. And creating, as you probably know, humans do things differently all the time. And every human, every, everyone in this room would do the same task slightly differently, either based on their ergonomics, their knowledge, et cetera. Yeah. And so being able to differentiate those things is often quite difficult. And so you have to create more individualized representations and technologies to be able to represent those safety issues that may arise and how humans would respond to those. And so when you have these sparse data sets, uh, some concepts like few-shot learning, zero-shot learning could be applicable, but you're still gonna have scenarios where the system puts his hands up in the air and says, I don't know what to do. Then you're left with the situation of the human being what we call out of the loop. The human doesn't know exactly what's going on and how to respond. And we've seen this repeatedly in autonomous vehicles, so autonomous cars and trucks. Um, and if you look at the amount of data that can be generated by an autonomous vehicle, it's about four terabytes a day, or over a petabyte a year. Um, and you know the autonomous car companies have, I think it was zettabots uh, or zettabytes of data that they've been training these vehicles on, and yet they still can't deal with these uncertainties, and there's still a number of safety issues. So I think that's something that we need to be keeping track of as we talk about this within the aircraft system safety. Now, if we talk about this in terms of smaller UAS, uncrewed aircraft in my space, then I do think there is a higher need for um, autonomy and AI because when you're talking about putting these aircraft in the hands of first responders or the civil engineers doing inspections of infrastructure or any other types of surveillance uh, types of tasks, uh, for example, uh, identifying what trees have to be cut down after a wildland fire, mm -hmm. then you are talking about individuals who are not at the same level of training as pilots of crewed aircraft. Mm -hmm. And even though the FAA will have training requirements in place, these are still not highly trained pilots who are going to be training continuously in simulations to respond to these events. So I think there's an avenue for AI to come in more in that space as kind of a test bed for some of the safety issues with the crewed aircraft. Hmm. Thanks, Julie. So Choo Choo, yeah, I, I would venture to say that you're less on the human factors in side of the house and more on the theoretical AI um, view. What's your view on how we can use AI and ML to accelerate testing and introduction into operations? Yeah, sure. I will uh, follow. I actually uh, uh, echo a lot of the points raised by Julie, and I want to follow up with uh, some more technical like uh, points of how AI can accelerate testing as like if we see testing as a problem of finding uh, a unique combination of the parameters or all the factors within all the uncertainties. That like basically testing is when a system is operating in the actual environment. There are many different aspects of uncertainty that can occur, and we want to know which is like the the combination or the very sparse set of combination that could lead to. Um, a mistake or a, a failure of the system. So within that sense, uh, what I feel like a, a, a huge uh, direction like a, um, in, in AI is to figure out the heuristic in the combinatorial search problem. So basically, if we see uh, 
like testing for us or including verification and validation is like a, a search of this unique combination in a company neutral choices. And the difficulty arise because there are so many different factors of the uncertainty. If we consider all possibilities, it will just grow up and it will soon get out of the capability of any computational resources. And um, a lot of the concerns people have about AI is also about this is a black box system that could have many different aspects of uncertainties. How would we even understand those uncertainties? But testing here like, is to find out the direction to go to find those unique combination. And here, what we really need is a heuristic. So what I see here, AI can, what I see uh, AI can play a role here is to give us the heuristic or at least learn from a huge amount of historical data to uh, figure out what's a good direction to search for that unique uh, environment that, that we should test on. So, uh, like, uh, as, as uh, has been said many times, aerospace is a very space domain. And what we often see is like a single failure here or a single failure there. But uh, it's very difficult to learn from a single failure how we could manage the risk. But AI here, it has the capability of parsing huge amounts of data historically, aggregates everything, and learn from those data what would be a good heuristic to go to like narrow down that testing that's m most likely going to give us a um, severe consequence. Uh, that would be a, a pretty interesting direction to explore within like the data science and also a uh, systematic view of testing. Thanks, Chuchu. So, Barclay, the reason I saved you for last at this first question is because you're the linchpin between one and two. So, okay. you're going to tell us <laughs> about how you can use AML in testing, but testing is part of your VNV for the products that you're providing. Right. And so, I'd love to hear your thoughts on one, but also lead us off on question two, which is, how do you do VNV about these AI okay. systems? So how do you use them for testing, but how do you validate them within the context of a system that you're gonna deploy right. in air and space to make decisions? Well, like any good politician, I'm gonna start out by answering the question I, wanna, I wanted you to ask, <laughs> and I'll get around to maybe your question. So uh, I, I come from the perspective not of a long experience in flight safety, or even in uh, airspace, right? But, but more as an AI practitioner, you know? And so I want to put AI to work, right? I'm less interested in the lofty, interesting ideas and theories about AI that kind of float out there, and more interested in what can we get AI to do now, you know, and soon, right? Maybe not today, but tomorrow. So what, first, let me, let me come on on this uh, AGI thing. AGI, artificial general intelligence, right, is the term. And we, in the AI world, have horribly confused everyone with this term. Because historically, for decades, what it's meant is human-like intelligence. In other words, intelligence that is essentially indistinguishable from a human being. In other words, near consciousness, near sentience. You know, that's what we mean by AGI. So uh, if, and, and by, all right, so that's, that's been the, the long-term definition, right? We have no idea how to build AGI. Let me just, that's my opinion, my reasoned opinion, right? Large language models, which I'm a huge fan of, it's my, it's my now chosen career, are not going to get to AGI. They don't possess mental states. Mental states appear to be necessary for general intelligence. Now, let me get to the confusion part. Some people have started applying the term AGI to large language models, saying that, they are that large language models are unlike specific AI models that do specific tasks, they're general AI models, and they do general tasks. They're generally applicable. You remember, anybody old enough to remember the term general purpose computer? Because mm -hmm. computers used to be more single purpose, right? And then came along with general purpose computers. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that sense of AGI that's being applied to LLMs, completely different sense of AGI, you with me, right? So don't be confused by that, right? If you want to call an LLM AGI in the sense that it has general applicability, that's great. It's not AGI, like artificial general intelligence. All right, so that may help a little bit. Um, the, the next thing is that I, I see a lot of parallels. One of, my, one of my other passions is quality, right? And I think quality is closely related to safety. It's not the same thing, but it's, it's tied in. And in quality management, one thing we say is that quality is meeting requirements. That's clear enough, right? But we also further say that requirements are meeting the customer's needs, wants, and expectations. 
the Holy Trinity, we call it, right? The needs, wants, and expectations, which is a lot higher bar than saying we meet the requirements that were written down by somebody in some document. You know, we're meeting the custom, just like someone gets on one of your planes, their needs, wants, and expectations are arriving safely in the, the things you said, right? So how do, how do we use this, right? Well, we use this by the essence of quality, as Phil Crosby and others have said, is prevention, mm -hmm. right? So how many, how many safety incidents last year did uh, Delta prevent? Well, Crazy question, you have no idea. Yeah. We prevented them, they didn't happen, they didn't show up, right? And commercial aviation, as you well know, is doing a fabulous job at this. The safety is very high. General, um, regional uh, commercial aviation, somewhat less. General aviation, somewhat less, right? And, uh, you know, people flying quadcopters around, who knows, right? But anyway, there's a continuum there. So how, do, how can AI be applicable, right? Well, one way, I'll give one, one sort of concept to throw out here, and then we'll see if we can circle back to your questions, um, is what I call the patient-human test, right? So the patient, a patient human is defined as follows. It's a human that has unlimited diligence, unlimited time, unlimited memory, mm -hmm. and uh, that's it, right? But no particular expertise or, or knowledge or background and so forth. So the question is, if you're thinking about something, could an AI do this? Well, first ask the question, could a patient human do that? Mm. In other words, given enough time and enough diligence and enough memory, could a patient human do it? And if so, you've got a real good chance of, an a, of, of being able to have an AI do it. If you can't imagine how you would explain to this patient human how to do this task, the AI is, you probably have a hard time getting an AI to do it, right? <clears throat> um, so, it, and uh, one, one other idea is, as we get to, to testing and validation. And validation, by the way, I, I will pick up on that. A lot of people uh, conflate ve verification and validation, and as a longtime systems engineer, it just makes me crazy, right? But I think there's a, a great relationship between uh, safety and quality and validation more than verification, right? Because validation is fit for purpose. Is it, is it going to meet the customer's needs, wants, and expectations now, right here in this situation? You know? And the, the, the incidents, I don't know what the right terminology is, but the incidents that, that became noticeable, in other words, something happened, Maybe it didn't turn into a full-fledged incident like a crash or something, right. but something happened, right? And we noticed, you know. Um, could that be prevented somehow? And, and, and to me, the, the source of a lot of the prevention of this is somebody knowing the right thing at the right time. Mm -hmm. And so now we arrive at my favorite, large language models, right? So is it possible that a, a, a suitably set up large language model application could do a good job at supplying the information to the right people at the right time? You know, pilots, from what I understand, in, in a lot of emergency situations, are kind of overwhelmed. As you said, there's, there's things going off all over the place. They're trying to figure out what to focus on. Um, you know, and, and they do a fabulous job, right? But could we supply better information at the right moment, yeah. you know, to, to, the, to the pilot, as an example of some, something that, that could help? And you were talking about lesser trained uh, training levels of pilots, and that's a factor in the regional and general and, and some other uh, areas, right? Could we supplement that less experienced pilot with a knowledge, a knowledgeable assistant who can't, he's not gonna fly the plane, it's not autonomy, right? But it could supply information, mm -hmm. you know, to the, uh, to the pilot. Okay. If I totally missed your question. No, 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 you did, because you uh, Are we getting there? Okay, go ahead. And oh, Julie, no. <laughs> which is, uh, you know, because uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, because this is an area in which you are one of the experts on. And so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. So I do think that, um, and, and thank you for picking up on a couple of the threads that I wanted to say and then forgot to say because there's just too many things to say uh, with regard to general AI and uh, large language models. Um, I do think that uh, it's very important to try to figure out what data can be used and we see some of that already in a lot of the systems, right? So in a lot of, and, and I will, but the caveat here is that I have not worked on crewed aircraft for about 20 years, so you guys all feel free to correct me. But, um, you know, I fly a lot. I flew jump seat on Northwest, which was great, by the way. Um, so uh, there are a lot of systems in place today that are intended to focus the pilot's attention when something is going wrong. And I think the, the piece that, I found interesting in what you said is, what are the things that started to be blips that could have turned into incidents that maybe even the pilots didn't know about? <clears throat> that in looking at the post-flight data, 
um, that you can then identify there was an issue um, and be able to, to use that to make a, a change. And so there's different types of users. And so you also have to factor that into what are the pieces of information you need to make prevalent or draw the person's attention to, and what is the responsibility? And it, in flight scenario, then obviously it's the pilots, right? Uh, but it also may be the dispatcher and ATC if there needs to be an emergency landing, as there was in Portland last week. <laughs> um, so, you know, there, there are differences that have to be focused on, and I think the idea of using large language models, you know, if I think about it in the context of pilots, you do have a, a, a reasonable amount of data that you can get through daily flight activities and training activities, especially the training activities where you can induce different types of incidents. Um, but again, the cautionary tale is it's only as good as the data you have, yeah. and it's the what you, um, the unknown, the known unknowns and the what are the things that you don't know that are going to be a bigger issue in this context. So how would you, I mean, I, I, I hear the nuance of, you know, we could put the AI in a role where it is helping, a as supporting, an, a supporting role. role, but how do you validate that it does the supporting role well? Because, you know, sometimes, <laughs> yeah. as we all know, having had grad students, sometimes they can come and you think that they're yes. right, but they're not, yes. right? And they yes. could lead you astray for a little bit, not too yes. long, obviously. Yes. Yes. Um, like so humans. the question is, how do yeah. you validate that? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a difficult thing, right? Um, I think there are methods uh, such as Choo Choo's Which methods is, yeah. and other individuals that I know that work in these areas that can be applied, um, but they can only get you to so far because as humans, we're all different. We all yeah. do different things and we all cause different problems. My students hate it when I come anywhere near their technology because I always do something they didn't anticipate on purpose to break it, right? Um, and so you can't always anticipate what humans are gonna do. And there's a lot of talk in this conference about digital twins, which I've been hearing about for 20 years now. You know, the digital twins are also only so good for creating and testing these systems, but they are a means of testing some aspects. Right. I think the other way that you do it is you try to induce these different environments and situations in the training scenarios to try to get some information from the actual humans and see how they respond. But again, that's still gonna be limited. I, I don't have a great answer of how do you test the unknown unknowns. Yeah. So Chu Chu, uh, I'm looking to you for the answer. Um, so, you know, we, we have two roles. One is the autonomy doing everything and the autonomy in the supporting role. Either one, you need to verify and validate them. What are your thoughts on, on how do we do that? Yeah, sure, I, I, I'd be happy to share some, some thoughts. Uh, first of all, I want to say that a validate, verification and validation of AI or machine learning it's not a solved problem and it's still like people are exploring how to do it. But at the same time, I'm quite optimistic about like eventually we'll be able to do it. And uh, I will talk about like why I think so. But before that, I want to follow up on the discussion about large language models. I also uh, echo the thought that large language models, uh, I also don't think is going to be the solution for AGI, but can be like good, um, source for us, like you can treat it as like a Mr. Known All to refer you to the right uh, tool or right information. A large trend these days of using large language model is now to kind of make large language model um, be more capable of solving every problem, but instead teach it to use all these tools that we have already developed. Like we have over the past five decades, we have developed so many different verification and validation tools, um, and including, I'm not sure if everyone knows about it, like the satisfiability solving is a very useful formal method tool for, um, for verifying programs and also for testing. Instead of saying whether large language model can solve this problem, we actually teach large language model to be able to use these tools uh, to, as a supplement to understand when that we we are to get to the answer, how to give this tools the right information to give us the answer, especially for those who are not experts of those 
a very broad set of tools. So that's a very uh, in interesting trend. I see that can go a much love, like longer, further away than, than like AGI type of routes, saying large language model by itself can solve all these problems for you. It's kind of similar to like this idea of supplementing information for using large language models for, for this uh, less trained pilots. But in this case, it's to uh, uh, teach large language models as like some sort of a intelligent agent that know how to use different uh, methods and tools to solve its own problem and communicate to non-expert in the domain. Now coming back to the problem of verification and validation of AI, either as like a decision-making role or as a, um, as a supporting role, I, I said I'm optimistic is because as Julie said, uh, AI is not only about uh, machine learning or neural networks. Actually, the, the program we have been writing and implemented already in the commercial airplane or many other types of autonomous systems are also considered as AI. So uh, the number of the lines of code that's, into, that's implemented in the airplane has grown like a lot exponentially in the, in the past de few decades. Now, like initially when people write programs there, do they know like these are perfectly fine programs that will never make any mistake? I don't believe so. I believe the first in it, like few iterations, there will be some iterations of like analyzing these tools. And then after program people, uh, after realizing that computer can take some roles of decision making uh, in like uh, in any type of like uh, system that will make our the pilot's uh, job a little easier or in robotics to like have some lower level of control being automatic. Uh, like knowing this programs that can really help a lot when people start, the people in uh, formal methods or verification and validation, they start to think then how should we guarantee that these programs will not make a mistake, they have developed this something called uh, automata theory. I'm not sure if everybody have heard about it, but the automata theory is the foundation of analyzing programs, making sure that all this program that's Im implemented here is not going to cause any trouble in the future. Um, so similarly, now uh, neural networks and uh, deep learning and reinforcement learning, these approaches have been developed a lot. People in the formal methods or BNV domain are looking at these approaches. We don't treat these as black boxes. We look at those as models. Neural network to a lot of people are black boxes, but for us, there is a very clear mathematical representation behind it. There is also a very clear, like how after compilation, how it's going to look like. Then there are like a lot of people developing technologies of understanding how we could um, what type of assurance we can provide to these specific models. This could be a huge neural network or could be a decision tree, could be a new AI that we haven't studied uh, before, but there are, like, we, uh, there are things we're doing, like for example, creating abstractions or understanding the reachability of these models or create some sort of a guaranteed uh, barrier that it will never, the system behavior will never get across this barrier. These are all the different types of technologies like people are developing to provide higher level assurance to these models. So that's why I'm saying I'm optimistic. It's not quite there yet because apparently this uh, neural network development is much faster than the uh, formal analysis techniques has on those, but it's, it's getting there and um, with if we know more and more about how these models are going to, going to look like, we will be, uh, there will be techniques, like uh, the, the techniques on the verification and validation will catch up. So speaking of that, there is also a, a discussion of open source and uh, closed close source. So I do believe that if for safety, for safety, uh, for the safety per part of analysis, uh, closed source type of you know model is not going to it's not going to it's going to create a lot of trouble here. So those are some of my thoughts. Maybe a little bit too technical. No, 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 wor no worries. Julie, you had a thought, and then yeah. uh, Barkley. But then so I, yeah, just had I have a question for you then guys. Then, yeah. Okay, we all want to talk about so, this on uh, this a, particular topic. A quick follow up. When I was responding, I was really thinking about human in the loop testing yep. and verification. However. 
If we look at some of the techniques that are being used in robotics specifically to use machine learning to generate test cases in order to evolve the capabilities of robots, so meaning trying to get the robots to learn how to respond to different environmental contexts without having to create those environmental contexts. I think there is room for using deep learning, machine learning, whatever your flavor of learning is, uh, to generate <coughs> different circumstances, and that may lead to generating some of the unknown unknowns that humans may not think of because you know we only do about seven plus or minus two things in our brains at the same time. Um, that may be a way of generating uh, test cases, if you will, for um, the systems to actually yeah. test. And to, and to validate the AI itself. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's what I meant. Yeah. Test cases for validating the yeah. AI. But also for also train the humans as well, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say I don't want anybody to be afraid of large language model applications because we think we don't know how to verify or validate them, mm -hmm. right? So as I kind of made a big point about how large language models are not AGI and are not like humans. So now let me sort of turn it over and say, but verifying and validating large language model applications is, I think, a lot more similar to verifying and validating humans than it is to some other kind of computer system. That's not exactly. easy. So for, uh, it's not easy, that's exactly <laughs> yes. the point. So if I'm talking to, to one of you, right, we've met and we're, we're talking, and I'm in my head, like you do, right, trying to figure out how much should I believe this person? You know, how much should I trust what this person says? And how do I, how do I gauge that myself? Well, one thing I look at is what's the background of the person? What are they presumed to know based on their education experience and so forth? But that's not the end of the story, right? I'm also like, well, you know, how are they, how are they coming across and what, are, what do they seem to be able to put together and what's their reasoning like? And by the way, did they, did they you know, win a Nobel Prize and they're brilliant, but maybe they've developed some dementia, you know, and so I, I shouldn't believe them so much. Or maybe they're straying out of their area and now they're starting to, to go into guesswork, even though they're brilliant, you see what I mean? All these kinds of things. Yep. And in fact, the way we judge the intelligence level of large language models right now is through benchmarks. And what do those benchmarks look like? They look like, in fact, they're drawn from standardized tests that we give human beings. We basically give it a college exam of sorts and say, how many questions does it get right? And we use that to rank LLMs. So one of the things that I, I've been talking about over the last couple of years is, the, is just that, which is that we should be verifying and validating our autonomy in the same way we do humans. And I always say in academia, you know, you can take a qualifying exam, mm -hmm. you can get the wrong answer, but still pass, because what we're actually trying to do is to assess how you think about problems, mm -hmm. how you reason. And you know, that's something that we, we, we tend to want to do, A-B testing, because that's what we do with hardware. But we need to think about how you, know, how you think about things, how you reason. And um, so that said, I'm gonna go back to something you said earlier for the two folks on the end of this line right here, and, because they're the linchpin between two and three. So you talked about need, want, and expectations. And you know, one of the things I always say to myself when anybody, say to anybody who tells me they need to have an autonomous system, I ask them, for how long mm. and to do what, <laughs> right? And the space folks know it, right? You always have a fail-safe mode, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in ATM, we have a VM leg, and you keep everybody going, and you, you have a passively safe system. Yeah. But there are other th times when you have something that you can only guarantee performance for a certain time. So the question to folks on the operating side, which is, for VNV, how long, how much? And how, leading to question three, how does that inform your calculus, for want of a better phrase, about where to put it and what things to allow it to do? Do you want to go first? You got this one. You go first. Okay. Um, so I'll start by saying the interesting thing I see on this discussion is, so the Aerospace Corporation, our bread and butter is independent validation verification. That's what we do. Okay, we, we do that all the time for space systems. But when we come to start talking about artificial intelligence, we don't use that term anymore. Mm -hmm. We use trust, right? Trusted AI. Mm. Just like you say you don't validate and verify a person. You, you trust, right? So that's, that's it's, it's a different in the language, and it's, it's basically because we see AI, the distinction between AI and traditional autonomous systems as the determinant versus the non-determinants. <clears throat> so it, it, it's just an 
a, a different way of looking at the problem. But to get to your answer, or the question you asked, uh, we developed a, what we call a trusted AI framework that we're starting to use to do this validation verification. And we take into account three main things to answer your question. One is how complex is the problem you're trying to address? How critical is the problem you're trying to address? And the third one is how autonomous is the system going to be? Um, and I'm gonna bring in a little anecdote, which is a couple years ago, we had a, a, a workshop on autonomy and there was a colleague from JPL who came in and he was the lead project manager for Ingenuity, right? The helicopter who flew on Mars. Amazing helicopter, amazing technology. That, can, that helicopter is essentially as dumb as a rock, right? We asked him, how much autonomy do you have on that helicopter? How much AI do you have on it? And he said, zero AI, and we made it as stupid simple as possible because we couldn't take, we didn't know how to validate or verify anything complex or smart about a helicopter, all right? In essence, ingenuity worked almost perfectly. I think they lost it almost once when it ran into a complex problem it couldn't quite figure out, but they were able to work around that, okay? So on the space side, extremely risk averse. Right, Ingenuity worked in a, for space, a, a relatively complex environment, right? Like I said, most spacecraft operations are simply stupid, dumb. You just go around in circles and hope you don't run into stuff. Um, but it was a complex environment and it had a high degree of criticality of failure, right? If the helicopter crashed, that was it, right? And then the, the third one is it was also extremely autonomous. They do not fly ingenuity from Pasadena, right? It has to fly it, 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 all its operations. So we take all that into account uh, when we're making those decisions. Um, things like imagery and trying to do edge computing and onboard computing of imagery, that is something we can allow a fair amount of leeway because we can let it run and then we can sort of observe it. The, the only key issue there is if you start to limit the bandwidth, you're trying to save money and communications by only putting down processed images, you may not get as much validation. Um, but if it came into things like uh, collision avoidance, which is the biggest safety issue we have in spacecraft, uh, we probably won't do much for quite some time in that area. Actually, interestingly enough, I asked if SpaceX does that, right? They're, they're operating the largest constellation. As far as we know, they don't use any sort of artificial intelligence, because it's actually fairly simple to avoid other spacecraft. Um, so, yeah, we, we do take all that into account. Um, one of the things that I know your next question is gonna get to, and, and you're using us as this linchpin, is when will we start to accept it? And I think the most interesting aspect of that is going to be on the human spaceflight, okay? The astronaut core has, as everyone knows, historically been very averse to other th systems making decisions for them, all right? Um, they're independent and they still have, a lot of them historically have that sort of I will make the decisions and I will own it. But just as we are getting used to autonomy on cars, right, you know, adaptive cruise control, lane centering, that kind of stuff, you slowly let it take over and do those kinds of things. But I don't think the astronauts are going to want to rely on AI anytime in the near future. But you flip that around and you say, when we send astronauts to Mars, Okay, they're gonna be out there and they're gonna have 30 minutes or 60 minutes of communication delay with Houston. There may be even some points where they're in opposition on the sun where they won't be able to talk to Houston at all. They want ground control right there with them. They're gonna want AI in a box or Houston in a box to do all that stuff. Okay, so once we get to that point, they're gonna have to trust it. It's gonna have to be there, they're gonna have to trust it. And so now they gotta start thinking back of what are we gonna be doing in the more near-term missions, the Artemis missions when you're going to the moon, so that we can start to learn how to trust AI. We won't depend on it like they will on the Mars missions, but they will have to actually start using it. I, and I think if you work backwards, they'll show you why they need to start doing it. If you just go progress forwards, they will try and avoid it as much as possible. Great, Andrew, so on the 
You know, let's yeah. think about not only the cockpit, let's think about ops control. Yeah. Let's think about all the other aspects behind the scene of an airline. Yeah. You know, what, what do the folks who do VNV have to do to get the trust that, and where would you start to introduce the? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. I'm really enjoying listening to the fellow panelists because they, they're, they're touching on a lot of things that I'm gonna try to pull, in, pull into my answer. And I'll start with a little bit of the, the journey. When I came to Delta six years ago, um, had done work previously with a lot of the flight data, both in terms of understanding in a machine learning space, the connections to known risks, so the, the known knowns, the events that had actual accidents. So connecting the threads, looking back along the flight profile, using this wealth of data to say, okay, we can start to predict which parameters are gonna have the largest influence, and then we can use classifier techniques to say, is this likely to have a high risk or not likely to have high risk? So there's a, there's a lot of promise there, and I was pretty convinced coming to Delta that we'd be able to pull in pilots and all of this knowledge and, and uh, do the same thing and really start to drive towards a knowledge of risk. And really, that's kind of the, for a commercial operator and for operations, right, that's the name of the game. Can we identify our areas of risk and start to buy that down? Buy that down through investments, buy that down through training, whatever that looks like. Well, over six years, <laughs> I've learned some of the lessons that our panelists have been talking about, which is almost every time without fail, when we bring in the concept of machine learning or models to our operational leaders, they will immediately throw water on it and, and say, well, this isn't going to work and here's why. <laughs> and every time they have a very valid reason as to why a pilot or a dispatcher or um, you know, someone who, a human, <laughs> in the situation of the operations have made the decision they made. So again, you come back to this problem that's already been, I'm, I'm not gonna try to restate it because I think Julian Barkley did a really nice job of pointing out the complications of dealing with the human when you're in the verification and, and validation steps. So when we're doing these models off of all of the data, what we start trying to do now is we start trying to set up situations where the model is helping us um, I'll avoid the word prediction, but kind of categorizing or classifying the data into areas of known risks, really a taxonomy of sort, and kind of going through and combing through the data. And we're starting to explore the large language models because you know they, they're even better at this. But the, the irony is, is you keep bringing that back to a human and saying the human is going to be basically the test taker. And, and the human is the one going through and saying, yes, this makes sense. No, this doesn't make sense. So if you're giving it a very specific task, you know, if you try to be as specific as possible initially to start to prove validity of some of these AI models, you might say, okay, we're going to pick a safety event that we know is a known safety event, and we're gonna go through all of our data and start to work at, um, you know, maybe even in an unsupervised way, let's start there, let's just let it comb through and tell us what it sees, and then maybe you give it some, some semi-supervised, and then eventually you kind of come back to this model where you're going, all right, these are the truths, this is the truth set, here's what the model predicted, and then we're coming back and validating the model get it right. And we really struggle in this space. And, and as I'm listening and I'm trying to articulate why we struggle, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, I don't think we have nearly as much data as we think we have, mm -hmm. right? So I'll give you some numbers. Um, again, coming back to the point that the aircraft data is fantastic. It's the, it's the backbone of everything that we do when we look at this. And I'll, and I'll pause a little bit to go, when you're looking at predictive maintenance, I know, you know we were talking earlier about some of this. If you take a step back and you go outside of maybe some of the more human-generated spaces of the operations, and you look at, say, predictive maintenance, there's a lot of promise right now that they're doing with understanding the signals with the engine, um, with the signals of some of the fault signals that are going into a lot of the components of the aircraft. Uh, and, and it makes sense when you start to unpack that. And there's a ton of opportunity for AI and a lot of these models to go in and start to predict the signals before failure, and then you adjust your, uh, your schedule, your maintenance schedule based on that. And that, that, that is going to be, I think, where airlines continue to invest heavily in a lot of these areas. And you see the engine manufacturers as well as uh, many airlines going down the space, and Delta has invested heavily there. When you bring humans into it, you get into a slightly different uh, problem space where now you're trying to understand the humans interactions with the environment that they're in with the aircraft and it's not just one human right so you have a crew so you have you know CRM or crew resource management how the crew interacts with each other um, you know Julie you mentioned jump seating right so it's always fascinating to go into the jump seat and here's these two people who may have never met in their life 
they're professionals. What other environment has that? You know, you don't take two doctors who have never met in their life and you go, go do surgery, go do brain surgery. So you take these two people who have potentially never met and you say, go fly this mission. Now, we try to, again, put a lot of fail-safes into that, right? So there's a lot of backup, there's redundancies. There's systems on board the aircraft and there's the air traffic controllers who are helping guide and navigate and everyone is supposed to have pre-planned and understand the mission very, very well. So you get into this, this fascinating dynamic now where you have humans, but in that, and I think you mentioned this earlier, Barkley, we don't really understand how often the humans are actually making the saves. And there's some work that's being done right now uh, by NASA and, and one of my colleagues, and I've had a chance to, to work with him, talking about, you know, we see the errors, but can we start to understand how often the humans are actually creating the saves? And I think some of what we need to do to build trust and to really understand this is we really don't have, again, I'll come back, we don't have all of the data we think we have, and I don't think that we've actually approached the problem from a holistic point of view. I think we've looked very much in the margins of, of the data sets that we have to look for those outliers and those errors, and then we try to use that to propagate all the way through and build the system dynamics. So back to your point, I think your, your question was how do we take in all the system dynamics I think that is the challenge in front of us, right? As, as we start to interface, one of the things that we do is we'll get safety reports. We try to connect all the safety report threads through the entire operation, right? So um, I'll take an example of turbulence. Turbulence, believe it or not, is one of our highest risks. I know it kind of feels maybe like a little bit of a boring topic. Uh, most of the commercial operation safety topics are a little bit boring uh, until it results in a passenger or someone actually getting hurt. And last year was the first time there was a fatality that was attributed to turbulence. So that put it all the way up at the top of the international uh, risk metrics because previous to that, it was always sort of left off that list because fatalities were not attributed to turbulence. And so it wasn't given the that highest risk ranking. But now we look at that and so we look at a lot of the precursors and we see a lot of injuries as a part of that. Well, there's, that's a complicated environment. You have dispatchers and you have meteorologists who are on the ground before the flight who are studying the environment that aircraft's about to fly in. You have pilots. Pilots have information being fed to them in real time. They also have their planning materials and they also have their crew interactions. You have flight attendants. The expectation for a flight attendant is what? Safe, yes, but also to make sure the customers are taken care of along the way. So they have a very different mission profile. So as you walk through this and you start to understand, okay, how, and this was our problem last year, how can we take all of the data sets that we're collecting and how can we start to use machine learning to understand, can we predict turbulence? Can we understand the communication involved? Can we understand where on the airplane is the highest risk of someone getting injured? And can we start to provide that information and training and uh, pre-briefs and all of that ahead of time? And it becomes pretty complicated to validate that we're doing that job well. So that, I think that's some of the challenge for us is to, to continue to find the right data sets and to come back to understanding how do we build that trust and validation when a lot of that knowledge is really stored in the operator's mind. So it's through training, they're building this, this system knowledge and our job is to try and draw that out. So one of the ways that we're doing that right now is we're trying to simplify um, how we draw out those, those safety reports. Elicit, elicit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, you guys hit on this thing of trust <laughs> as opposed to VNV. And, you know, the two top questions from the audience are how do you test to create trust? That's mm -hmm. what I wanted. At the Verify Safe Operations. <laughs> and how do you address the public perception, which is a slightly different aspect. So I'm putting that, you know, to answer the two top questions and get finish up this last one. To you first, Julie. Barkley, and then to you, Choo Choo. Sure. How do we test to create trust? And how do we deal with the public perception of trust? Because, you know, as engineers, we tend to think in numbers. Mm -hmm. And the public doesn't think in numbers all the time. Some do, but not all. That's right. And so how do we bridge those gaps in trust to make, you know, uh, Tori and Andrew happy and willing to put AI as either a support role or in a decision-making role? So there's lots of different ways to, to look at trust within this context. Because it's, as you said, the public trust. It's also the corporate trust in the data, but also the individual, I'll take a pilot in this case, trust in how the data is being used. And in the human factors, and in the human interaction space, human systems interaction, human machine teaming, 
You know, trust is something that we've been working to try to objectively assess uh, for 30 years, and we still do not have good solutions to it. Even in the subjective space, so questionnaires and things of that nature, we're still very, very limited in having reliable and repeatable metrics of trust um, in these contexts. Now, in my own personal research, we do a lot of work with physiological monitoring of humans. Um, I do not use things like EEGs or EOG because in my space, my humans are moving around. Um, FNIRS also does not work for me. But there are a lot of people looking into these technologies to try to assess what's happening with the human uh, state. And in my case, we're trying to predict their performance when working with robots and so that the robot can either adapt how it's going to interact with that human or change its autonomy, redistribute tasks across team members. There are very good sets of data starting to come out of that research, but it's very nascent, I would say. I've been working on it for 15 years. Um, so I, in addition to it being nascent, I think you also have to look at the fact that while that can build trust from the corporate perspective or the public perspective, because it does give you that quantitative data to look at, from the pilot perspective, it raises a lot of questions. Mm. Um, some of them ethical of nature, in nature of what is the company doing with my data? Yeah. And especially in a pilot scenario where there are metrics that have to be met in order to retain your licensure, you know, I think there'd be a large amount of concern of how that data could potentially be used to disqualify someone from their job. Um, so trust is a really very, very difficult thing. Um, I think it might be easier, quotation marks, because it's not that much easier to build trust in the public. And I think, you know, we've done that. Uh, the aviation industry has done that. We all got on airplanes, or most of us got on airplanes to come here, right? And as was referred to earlier, we didn't think about the safety when booking our flight. Now I can tell you, trying to plan an around the world trip, I am looking at different uh, airlines and different parts of the companies, our country's safety records, because it's not Delta. It's not American, it's not United. You know, So I think that public trust is easier to try to get metrics out there than some of the other aspects. So I'll, I'll maybe take a little bit minority report here that uh, I think trust is easier than some of us are making it out to be. And hum we already trust, we already know, we already trust or not trust each other. By the way, you already trust a lot of technology. Did you know that? In a lot of your cars, the steering wheel is not mechanically connected to the front wheels. Does that bother you? you're trusting a whole bunch of electronics that are in between that steering wheel and, and other stuff. When you step on the brakes, you're it's not, they're mostly electronic systems. Your accelerator is usually not, no more link, directly linked to the fuel lines, right? It's electronic control, you're trusting all this stuff, right? But why do you trust it? Well, you trust it because of two things, knowledge and experience, right? You, you know how it works, you know that cars of this type, of this brand generally work, you know, you have all this kind of background knowledge, and then your own experience. Well, the last 50 times I drove this car, it worked fine, right? So in trusting AI, by, by the way, we go back again to large language models, of course, because that's the answer to everything, by the way. Um, is How do you come to trust that? What, what the mistake people are making now, and this just comes from a lack of knowledge about them, is they say, well, I've heard this thing is really smart, so let me ask it a question. They ask it a question, and they don't get exactly the answer they want. And they say, well, I guess this thing, you can't trust this thing. I guess this thing, I said, wait a minute. I bet I can improve your question and get you the right answer. In the same way, if I'm talking to a human expert, and if I ask them a question, I don't get a good answer, do I give up on this expert? And I'll say, wait a minute, maybe you didn't understand my question. Let me explain, let's talk a little bit. Let's go back, and, you know, and let me learn how to interact with this thing so that I can produce the best possible result, and then maybe I come to, come to trust it a bit more. So trust boils down to, again, probably very minority report here, is uh, utility. So I trust my phone. How, ma how many of you trust Google Maps to navigate you somewhere? Is it, how many know it's not perfect? How many have seen it make mistakes? How many still use it? Okay, so this is a good illustration of a certain amount of trust, but not absolute trust, right? There's still the allowance for, there could be something, you know, but you come to trust something through your knowledge and experience. You didn't talk about regulatory frameworks, which I think is really okay. important as well, right? I mean, we talk about 
cars and trucks, or we talk about even aviation, the regulatory frameworks help build trust in these yeah. systems. And yeah. I think that's also why we are seeing Europe, who's out ahead of us, uh, starting to really move ahead with their regulatory frameworks for AI, and we're starting to get that happening in the United States. So back in November, you know, the administration uh, announced uh, work towards developing regulations for AI, and we're starting to also see that at the state level. So, um, Chushu, I, I wanted you to weigh in on this, but I also wanted you to, to give your thoughts on the next question on the list, which is, um, you know, we have lots of other domains using AI, cars to some success, or some might argue some disrepute, yes. uh, <laughs> and other domains. How, how, how do we leverage that in terms of building trust through those experiences or learning from them as a way what not to do or how to do things differently? I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Chu Chu, on that. Yeah, sure. I definitely, uh, with, uh, like, with respect to how to build trust, I definitely agree with uh, Julian Barkley. Something I want to add. Uh, about like AI by itself, we haven't really touched that a lot about it a lot today, but uh, explainability would be to me a very important factor when we can trust AI. So basically I, I see like we trust other experts because they not only tell us what to do, but why. And also it's just like not a one level of reasoning. It's like you decide you should do this because of some other sub problems or some other you know uh, reasoning process and every step is based on something else that's like more trustable and eventually everything we trust it because everything this whole reasoning process boils down like to something like fundamentally everyone have a very high level of trust i feel like uh, a lot of a lot of research has been going on on explainable ai like the people of course, it uh, uh, have different ways of calling it AI explainable, but ultimately they want to build on the like the decision or the suggestion based on something else, and that something else should be also like has a higher level of of a trust, and also like it's multiple steps. Uh, speaking of that, now uh, in terms, especially in larger models, what people want to avoid is the hallucination problem, right? Like, if you want to explain, you explain like why you want to do it, because, like, uh, for example, we were looking at whether we can teach larger models to write some very formal specifications about a uh, ver ver verification problem, and this specification will be in a speci specific language, and. When the large language model tell you you should write it in this way, you don't really know if you don't know that language. But if the large language tell you you write it in this way because this uh, operator means this meaning, and that I can give an example from an existing document, and you have more of a trust. Now, if uh, a big problem here is the the reason that large language model or any like AI decision making process give you should be based on a, f a fact, not a a, a fake fact, like a fake hallucination. So I, th I believe if we can improve both, like to uh, somehow make sure there's no hallucination in this whole inference process, and at, at the same time, the AI can explain to people as much as possible, there will be a higher level of trust that we can build on top of it. So I, can, I feel like that's connect to uh, both the previous questions and also what we can learn from other domains. In this, um, I, I believe this explainability or explainable AI is also a, like a, it's a very active research area explored in many domains, especially in large language models. Like people are nowadays, there are companies like the second largest uh, large generative AI company, um, Anthropic, is kind of claiming they're building these models that you can trust because it will only tell you uh, things that based on facts, not on, not on like just a, some simple inference. Thanks, Juju. So, uh, you know, you said something earlier, Barclay, about the patient human. Um, and building trust also requires a patient human. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have this joke where if you had two types of people in the world and two types of weather, there'd be five religions. They'd be the people who woke up, wake up early who believe that because they woke up early, it's sunny. Those who wake up early 
who believe it's because they wake up early. It's really just by happenstance of the sequence of events that happened when they started looking at the data. And then, of course, the fifth religion would be the people that say that's stupid because we actually know statistics. So the question then is, how do you deal with that impatience and the presumption that a lot, all of us have at some point? We're, all of us have finite patience where we see some behavior, we see some correlation, and we immediately jump to causality. How do we deal with that? Well, I think it's simple, too. I think Plato, or maybe it was Socrates, had the answer to this, right? And he said, the only thing that really changes people is education. And not just formal education, like, yep. you know, teaching in a college, but when you actually learn something. So as people learn to, you know, and I'll come back to what else? Large language models, right? As a lot of people are still very bad at prompt engineering, is, the, is what we're calling it, right? But, and I, I, a lot of times people say, I tried this application, I couldn't get it to work, so oh, let me look. And we, let's prompt it this way, let's add this, let's do this, and they get it to work, right? Because that's, it's still an early skill. So people have to learn more how to deal with these, with, with these things, and they'll, um, and they'll come to know it. You know, I, I, I got a Volvo a few years, and it has the lane keeping and stuff. So did I turn it on and just, you know, eat a sandwich and just forget about it? No, and the first time I turned it on, I was, my hands were right near the wheel. I'm like, oh, what's this thing gonna do, you know? But over time, I came to trust it more because I knew. But I also now know situations where it's probably not gonna do well. Right. And I see it coming. I see if it's, it's a barrel zone up here, I'm like, hmm, I'm probably gonna have to, you know. So knowledge brings experience. The other thing I wanna point out that's is sort of like the most obvious thing in the world, right? We, as society, humans in general, seem to have a much higher expectation for the performance level of AI than we do for humans. We will tolerate 30,000 highway or traffic deaths every year in the United States, but we won't tolerate one crash caused by an AI on a car. Even if that same AI on that same car, by the way, avoided a thousand other deaths by how it operated normally. Now, I mean, it's, you can't really do math with lives, right? So it's, it's a little bit invalid to think that way. But we do have to take a more holistic view, you know, if we can save a lot of it. But, and, and maybe some AIs are being rushed to the market too soon. I don't know, maybe we need more regulation in that. Um, but uh, who knows, some of those things turned out to be human error too, some of these famous crashes. You know? So Andrew and Tori, uh, how, how have <laughs> the experiences in other domains shaped the view, not only your view, but I mean in your organizations and similar organizations about trust. Um, yeah. Have they helped, hindered, you know? What are the lessons learned as you go about, as people go about implementing AI? Yeah, with, with pilots, sometimes it can be a mixed bag. So the, um, you know, and I think most folks probably know this, but it was alluded to earlier, the, the, the data has traditionally been considered pilot data. When you fly a flight that pilots view that as their data, it's always been locked down. So the governance model previously was that data could not be used. And over time, we've had to work to build that trust, to build a governance model. We say, we'll use the data, but no personal identifiable information will be associated with it. And this means different things. So that model continues to exist in the US. Um, as pilots have become more comfortable with Google, Apple, other things kind of having their information, you see this, this, this interesting uh, um, phenomena happening. Some pilots kind of go, hey, I understand the value now from other areas of using data. And, and one of the things that we do, I should back up, I say one of the things that we do is we give data to pilots on their EFB. So this is probably the biggest application we have right now of using AI. And we give that to them for their pre-flight briefing on threats. Now, to build that trust, those flights that we put in there and the humans behind the scenes who are helping validate that need to do a really good job because we're gonna tell a pilot their likely uh, route that they're gonna fly that day, their runway, we're gonna tell them some of the things that they're gonna experience, and then we're also gonna give them the information of what happened on that flight. So you can imagine you degrade trust very quickly with any amount of errors. So we're constantly conscious of that. Some pilots have been very standoffish to that initially because they don't trust the other applications they see in the world. And they say, I don't want auto drive, I don't want Apple, I don't want customized uh, you know, commercials coming up, I, I don't want any of that, so I'm opting out. But what we've done is we've been able to kind of create that groundswell by making sure that when we do put it out, that the knowledge being given is useful, 
and that the experience that pilots are having by seeing that, you get this groundswell by, by bringing pilots together, and one pilot goes, man, that was awesome. I didn't ever think it would be good, and now I had a really good experience with that. So we've had to be incredibly patient to kind of walk through and have those relationships and not try to jump too far, but to say, let's take this next step and we're gonna hold your hand and we're gonna be very cautious in, in terms of introducing that. Cool. Tori, on the space side, you know, people see all these things happening in other domains. I'm sure people say, like, why yeah. are we not doing this? Or, oh, well, let's not do this. So what, what are, what's your... Yeah, so no, everyone it always appreciates when someone else is spending a lot of money and making a lot of lessons learned, right? That's the best thing is someone else sort of proves it out first. Um, the areas where we definitely take advantage of other work is especially in the areas of machine learning. You know, a lot of space missions are just observing, observing the Earth and observing different things. There's a massive amount of work there for other applications that we can take advantage of. Uh, to get back to the trust issue, though, the other thing is, is in aerospace, a lot of our missions are for uh, Department of Defense, right? And we also have to account for intentional adversarial um, actions that would disrupt the AI's capabilities. So that's one of the things from a trust side of thing aspect that we will have to deal with that the other, maybe some of the other groups don't have to deal with. There was that classic story, I don't know if you heard about the, the Marines that had to get past this camera and the camera had some say AI capability to detect what a Marine was, right? And so one of them would like put a box over his head and walk forward and then it didn't know it was a Marine, right? So we have to deal with that kind of stuff too. But vision, uh, definitely a lot of vision. Love the natural language or the large language processing th kinds of things. You can use that in any industry, and I think one of the areas where we're gonna use it the most is in requirements, right? Someone says, hey, here's a requirement, I gotta meet that requirement. Well, what, why? What's that requirement come from? There's lots and lots of information about lessons learned in aerospace, but no one goes back and reads it, right? A lot of people sort of ingrain that, but those people are retiring. The large language processing allows you to say, here's this requirement, let, tell me all about the lessons learned that led to that requirement, mm. and tell me all about the other things that led to those lessons learned. Mm. That's a huge thing, especially with the brain drain we have in aerospace. That the large language processor is essentially like a really smart person who knows a lot about history, if you can trust it, yep. to help advise you to really understand why you have those requirements and how you could perhaps amend those requirements. Mm. So. Great. So we have a few minutes left. I'm not sure of the clock time. So I'm going to go to the fourth highest question, and this is a selfish question. And I, that on, on my own behalf, but on my academic colleague's behalf, and the academic colleagues in the audience who voted it up. <laughs> what, and I'm going to ask it first to the three of you at the end. What kind of training is needed for engineering students or early career engineers to prepare them to work with AI? and in particular with AI and aerospace. I, I, we want to know, so we're taking notes because you know, this is going to go into ideas about curriculum and... Well, you want the most opinionated answer first? Okay, so that's, <laughs> that would be... So uh, here's, I, I was talking to a bunch of uh, graduate systems engineers one time, right? And so they, many questions, blah, 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 right? And at the end, they're like, all right, Dr. Brown, give us one tip. What's your one tip that you're going to tell it? Right at the end, after asking me everything, I was like, I've got to come up with another tip, you know? And I just, it just came out. I just said, learn Python. <laughs> and it, it really turned out, you know, like, I, I believe that. Why? Because we need to turn you into programmers? No. Because you should go into software? No. Because you need that as a tool in your engineering work to do your work better. I, I teach a little course in, inside our company called Excel with Python for engineers. And it teaches just enough Python, just this little bit from, from, from scratch, to be able to read data out of spreadsheets, do some stuff with it, spit it back out into other spreadsheets. And there's so many things that can be done that way. And plus, it's a gateway, right? People are like, oh, well, now what else can I do, right? And then they grow. So that's one thing. Second thing, I was going to say to everybody, learn more about AI. What drives me, and I think a lot of you crazy probably, is people talking about AI when they don't know anything about AI. And they are, in quality management, we have a technical term for that. We call it guessing. And, and guessing is not, it is sometimes believed is the worst part, right? So learn more about AI. And I'll give you one tip on that, deeplearning.ai. So the website, deeplearning.ai. That's Andrew, one of Andrew Ning's projects. He's got a, pro, a little course on there. It's delivered through Coursera. You can do all this free. Uh, AI for everyone. 
So go take that, get your brother to take it, get your boss, get your mother to take it. Everybody should take that course. And, they get, and then there's many other courses if you want to go yep. deeper, right? But learn enough so that you don't have to guess about this stuff, so yep. that you know it and you get it. Yeah. Andrew and Tori, what, what, you're, you're going to be hiring people. Uh, you, you hire <laughs> people all the time. Uh, you know, what is it that you want um, your incoming um, employees to know? Yeah, I'd say Python is a great one. Um, I, <laughs> there's definitely all those courses, right? Even Google offers those easy courses, and, and I think you mentioned probably the best one because you're more familiar with Maya. Just there's tons of internet information out there. Um, just learn and have that open mindset. Yeah, I tell people stay curious. You know, I mean, this stuff is changing so rapidly. It was different ten years ago. It'll be different ten years from now. And so I think just don't have a mindset that you have it figured out when you come into an interview. And for me, I mean, that curiosity will show through. And the ability to learn Python, learn about AI, and learn other techniques as they come out. All right. So Choo Choo and Julie? I was going to say, I think it goes to the point that Andrew just made. It's lifelong learning. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, having taught at top universities, taught at teaching universities where the focus was on industry people getting uh, graduate degrees, you know, the it really is important that people recognize you finish your degree, you're not done. You have to spend your entire life continuing to learn, whether it's Python or the next generation of languages or the next generation of AI or the next computing chip, you know, and, and being open to understanding that you have to do that, but also being able to identify reliable sources of information, <laughs> yeah. such as what was pointed out with Andrew's class. And Choo Choo, you get the last word. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything that's been said. Maybe I can give uh, like a very high level thought I have. I, I, I feel like both in academia and in industry, maybe in industry more, maybe like the, the, uh, capable, the capability to run to the fire instead of run away from the fire when you face a problem like in industry. I think that's, that's not like a specific skill, but like this mindset of, especially for me if, to deal with anything related to safety, you really have to get close to understand it and get have the, have the courage and have the confidence to solve it than you know, running away from it. Thank you. And unlike Andrew, we don't have the luxury of 14 and a half minutes being on time. So, uh, 14 and a half minutes late being on time, Cassie <laughs> on time, so we have to end on time. Thank you all very much. It was gr a great conversation, um, and um, I'm sure uh, uh, folks will be following up with you individually outside, et cetera, on some of the things that happened here. I have some challenge coins to give out, but you don't have to stay and watch me giving these out. And, and you guys know about challenge coins, right? So, um, with that said, thank you very much.